Hi, this is Dr. Kent Meldrum. I am one of the obstetrician and gynecologists at May Grant. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about abnormal bleeding and some of the ways that we can really help correct this uh, problem for our patients. So when we talk about abnormal uterine bleeding, it's any uterine bleeding that is outside the realm of a normal cyclical period. Um, it can be heavy bleeding, it can be prolonged bleeding, it can be uh, bleeding in between your periods, those are all considered abnormal. So there are multiple reasons and management options that are available for women who have this abnormal bleeding. Abnormal uterine bleeding is a very common problem. About one in five women experience abnormal uterine bleeding throughout their lives. And it's a very common reason why patients will come see us at May Grant to figure out what to do about this abnormal bleeding. So abnormal bleeding, again, has multiple uh, causes and multiple um, ways that it negatively impacts our patient's quality of life. Some of the ways is the heavy bleeding um, you can, or prolonged bleeding negatively impacts patients physically where you may uh, feel fatigued, you may um, have significant pain or cramping during your cycle. Um, socially, you may limit the activities that you do during your periods or during the times that you're having bleeding. Activities like exercise or intercourse um, and it may impact your ability to work or go to school. You may miss days at a time during those heavy uh, period days. Or emotionally, some people get um, very, it affects your emotional well-being. It can affect um, your mood. Some people feel isolated or depressed during their periods if they're heavy or prolonged. So all of these facets of life can be negatively affected by abnormal uterine bleeding. So some options to evaluate and manage this abnormal bleeding would be to see your provider. So if you want to see your gynecologist, that's one of the things that we do. Um, they would see you, they would take a thorough history of this bleeding, um, ask you any of your past medical history and see if there's anything that would help us determine why the bleeding has changed or why it's heavier or longer than it was. So we get a thorough history, we do a physical examination, Sometimes we'll order some blood tests and often we'll order an ultrasound just to try and get to the root of why this bleeding is happening. Once we get all of that back, we start to talk about options to treat it. Different ways to treat abnormal bleeding is based on what we find during the evaluation and workup. If the evaluation seems normal or reassuring, but the bleeding continues to be a problem for you, then we have several options. So one of the first options for managing abnormal bleeding would be expectant management, sort of a grin and bear it or a medical management. That's where you would just take medication to help with the symptoms. Um, you can take ibuprofen products, naproxen. There are some prescription medicines that can help control the bleeding to some degree and just help you with some of the symptoms. This is op often an option that patients will pick if they want to get pregnant in the near future or just do not tolerate hormonal medications. Uh, another option is to treat it with medications. That would include hormonal medications. So if people think about birth control options like the pill or the patch, there's a vaginal ring, there's other medications like an injection or intrauterine devices that can help control your bleeding and make it less cumbersome or bothersome to you. So there's hormonal options. And then there's surgical options as well. Um, that would include something called an endometrial ablation in addition, or just a dilation and curatage. Or you can get a hysterectomy where we actually remove the uterus itself. So that's sort of the whole gamut of treatment options from medication to day surgery to a full hysterectomy. So when we talk with our patients and come up with a management plan, a lot of things come into play. Age is sometimes a factor. If you're interested in future childbirth, that's a big factor. Um, if there's anything that we see that's out of the range of normal, if there's uh, abnormality to the uterus, um, or if we find anything in the blood work that's concerning, that may prompt one direction or another. Also, your medical history is important to deciding is it safe to give you hormones or is surgery maybe a, a more appropriate option? So there's lots of things that you could come up with with your healthcare provider 
to decide um, what works best for you, your current lifestyle and medical um, health history. So some people find that hormones don't help or they just don't tolerate the side effects. So then they come in asking about surgery. So there's really two main camps of surgery. There's a day surgery where you would come in and we would um, look inside the uterus with a camera, that's called a hysteroscopy, and clean out the inside of the uterus if there's anything that's abnormal. Or we can, in addition, add what's called an endometrial ablation. The endometrial ablation is a day surgery that takes about five minutes or less, where we put insert a device in the uterus and it destroys the lining of the uterus, the endometrium. That's the part that causes the bleeding every month. So this um, ablation permanently destroys that tissue. The definitive treatment is considered a hysterectomy. That is a major surgery where you would be staying in the hospital overnight. Um, but it's going to remove the uterus and cervix. Typically nowadays we do take out your fallopian tubes, but often we can leave in your ovaries. So you, go, you do not go through hormonal menopause, but you don't have periods anymore at all. So a lot of women come in thinking that they either have to have, take hormones for the rest of their life or get a hysterectomy. They don't realize that there's a middle ground. Um, so what I'd like to talk about right now is the endometrial ablation. That is that middle ground. The endometrial ablation is a surgical procedure that permanently destroys the endometrium, the lining of the uterus, that causes your periods. So by permanently destroying that tissue, um, your periods will become lighter or they will stop altogether. The endometrial ablation is a safe procedure. It's done in an outpatient setting where a patient will come in, they have the procedure and go home the same day with some mild to moderate cramping and some discharge that may last for a few days and may last for a few weeks. The results from the endometrial ablation are very good. For an outpatient surgery, there's a 90% satisfaction rate that the periods are lighter, less problematic for the patient, and there's about a 40% chance your periods will stop altogether after the procedure. So the endometrial ablation isn't for everybody. So you have to have a normal sized uterus. If it's too big or too small, it won't work for you. You need to be completely done with any future childbearing plans. And you can't have any kind of infection or precancer, cancerous lesions of the uterus itself. Other than those, most people are good candidates for the endometrial ablation. So an endometrial ablation is a outpatient procedure. It can be done in an office setting or in an operating room. But regardless of where it's done, you'll still go home the same day and have a very quick recovery. Here at May Grant, we do offer office endometrial ablation, and we perform the Novishore endometrial ablation. And we also can offer it in the hospital, and we pref preferentially do our surgeries either at Women's and Babies Hospital or at the Physician Surgery Center just on the other side of the health campus off of Rorstown Road in Spring Valley. So the benefits of having an endometrial ablation instead of a hysterectomy will include a very quick recovery. It is an outpatient procedure. You can get back to normal activity within one to two days. Um, there's no activity restrictions other than what your provider may give you temporarily for the first couple of days or weeks of recovery. Um, and minimal pain um, and very low risk of complications compared to the hysterectomy, which works great to stop your bleeding, but it is a major surgery. Um, typically it's an overnight stay in the hospital. You'll have four to six week recovery where some restrictions as far as activity, lifting, you will have to miss uh, several weeks of work if you, if you do work. Um, and there's the expense of the hospitalization that can happen with that. Both are very good, very effective treatments for abnormal bleeding but you have to balance between the two. Now, a common question is, if I can do the endometrial ablation in the office versus the operating room, how do I decide? 
Well, the benefits of having the endometrial ablation or the Novasure in the office are a very quick visit. Most patients are scheduled for an hour. So you prep for this office visit by taking medication approximately an hour before your appointment. That medicine includes pain medicine and potentially some nausea medicine. That will help you during the actual procedure. Stay nice and calm, relaxed, and be able to talk through the procedure during those 10, five to 10 minutes during the procedure when it's most uncomfortable for our patients. Um, usually you're in the office for about an hour. We want you to have a light breakfast so you don't have to come in fasting. You do not need an IV, um, but you'll be awake and talking with our staff and your physician during the procedure. And then someone will drive you home. So again, most patients are here for an hour or less for the office-based procedure. You go home, you recover, and by the next day, you should be feeling pretty good to be able to do pretty much any activity you feel comfortable doing. Comparing that with the endometrial ablation in the hospital or in the operating room, um, you will be asleep. That's the biggest difference. You'll be very comfortable and asleep, but you do have to be fasting to come into the hospital. You will need to get an IV. You'll be registered. You'll start in day surgery. You'll meet the whole team. So you meet the staff that's gonna take care of you in our day surgery department. You'll meet the operating room nurse, the anesthesia provider, your surgeon. Um, and then as you recover, that takes about an hour as well because of the anesthesia. So they'll get you up walking, eating uh, crackers, some juice. So you're in the hospital for probably about three to four hours based on how you're doing and based on the type of anesthesia that's used. So some contrast there, but both options are very good options. They're both outpatient options where you go home and recover very quickly. Um, but sometimes you, the anesthesia takes a little longer to recover. So some people aren't feeling quite 100% after 24 hours. They may need an extra day to kind of recover from that. But again, doing most activities that you would need to do at home uh, after 24 hours. Another uh, difference between having the office endometrial ablation versus the endometrial ablation in the operating room uh, can be cost. So one of the benefits of having the endometrial ablation in the office is that we can tell you up front how much the cost is going to be. For patients that have met their deductible, often it's free or there's just a copay, whether it's $25 or $35. So that's a very reasonable cost to have an office procedure with a 90% success rate. If you have it done in the hospital, we have um, no way to let you know how much that cost will be. You'd have to check with your insurance company, see what their benefits are, and we'd have to have a discussion about how much we think it may cost to have the procedure done in the hospital where there's an OR cost, a surgeon cost, an anesthesia cost, and hospital charges. So um, that would be a conversation that we would have with you but um, you'd have to find out based on your insurance um, payment model how much that would cost as an estimate. Um, so very transparent what your cost is going to be if you have it in our office. Um, a little more nebulous if you have it done in the hospital, but both options are great options for patients and um, we would encourage you to investigate both uh, as you're thinking about having the ablation. So most people are very good candidates to have it done in the office. Some of the things we look at are, where you, is your insurance company gonna authorize it to be done in the office, because that's important. Um, how you do with pain management, if you're comfortable being awake during the procedure, knowing that we do give you pain medicine ahead of time and we numb up that cervix to make it as comfortable for you as possible. And then if you have any medical comorbidities, any medical problems that would make it more risky or dangerous to have it done in the office, uh, we have to take that in consideration. But the vast majority of patients are great candidates to have it done in the office. So one of the most important things after the endometrial ablation is that you have to have some type of contraception or birth control on board. So the endometrial ablation is not a sterilizing procedure. So it is possible to get pregnant after the endometrial ablation. If you were to get pregnant, it is a very high risk for both the mom and the fetus. So we need to avoid that. Um, so you have to have some type of reliable birth control or contraception after that. It could be something as simple as um, a tubal ligation or a vasectomy. Those are very good long acting permanent 
uh, contraceptive options. Some people just use condoms because they've used them their whole life reliably and they feel comfortable with that. But you need to have something that you're very comfortable using to avoid any unplanned or undesired pregnancy uh, after the endometrial ablation. So what workup is necessary before you actually get the endometrial ablation? Some of that depends on how your bleeding is and age and other medical problems or comorbidities that may contribute. Some of the most important things we need to do is figure out why you're bleeding and if we can correct that, then maybe you don't need the endometrial ablation. But having ruled any uh, medical problems out, then we just need to prove that you're a good candidate for the ablation. We need to prove that there's no precancer or cancer that's in the uterus. Sometimes we can tell that by just getting an ultrasound. Other times we need to sample the lining of the uterus, the endometrium, to prove that there's no abnormal cells or precancer there. That is typically done in an office setting. It's called an endometrial biopsy. And most patients can tolerate that very well with just some ibuprofen or Tylenol. And that's also a very good test. If you tolerate that, you'll do fine with an office-based endometrial ablation, if that's something you're interested in. So how does it work? How do you get set up for an ablation from start to finish? So often a patient will present to our office either referred from your primary care doctor or self-referred because you're already a May Grant patient and meet one of our providers. It could be one of our nurse practitioners, one of our doctors, and they assess you and you determine together that you do have abnormal uterine bleeding, heavy periods, and you would like that treated. They will typically then set you up for some lab work, some uh, typically blood draws, uh, the pelvic ultrasound, and then they would set you up with the provider that does endometrial ablations, whether in the office or in the operating room. Once you meet with that provider, typically they're going to either offer sampling of the lining of the uterus, the endometrial biopsy, or they'll just sit down and talk to you about your treatment options to include hormones, the endometrial ablation, hysterectomy. And depending on the evaluation and workup and the results that they find, they, you would come together with the plan of saying, no, I actually want the endometrial ablation. If you have a friend that's had it and it worked great for them, or you just read about it, or you're excited to try something that has a very high success rate and a very low uh, risk. Um, once it's determined that you want the endometrial ablation, we then notify our scheduler, who will then call you and find a date that works for you. And the provider that's going to do the surgery will have the consents finished. Uh, any medication that you would need to take prior to the ablation or during the ablation would be sent to the pharmacy for you to pick up. And then you just present yourself. If it's done in the office, you prevent yourself, present yourself at May Grant, the Good Drive office, um, and the nurses there would screen you in, take you back, and be able to get you set up for the ablation that day. You'll need a driver that would bring you and drive you home because of the medication that you're on uh, would prohibit you from safely driving to and from the office. And you'll be here for about an hour total for the ablation in the office. If it's done in the hospital, then you would start at the hospital um, stay there for about three to four hours, have the ablation, and again, someone would need to be driving you home and typically would watch you for the next several hours to make sure that you're recovering fine from the procedure and from any anesthesia you may have. So the recovery typically um, would be about a day or two of cramping, and that's traditionally managed with ibuprofen products like Motrin, Advil, Tylenol is needed, and a heating pad. And then you have discharge anywhere from three days to two weeks. Um, some people have a little longer discharge um, and that's the typical recovery. But by the next day, you should be able to exercise if you're comfortable with that. Um, you should be able to hopefully go back to work in one to two days and then back to normal activity from that point on. So with such a high success rate and a quick recovery, um, what are the risks of the endometrial ablation? Well, the most common risk is it just may not work. So about 10% of patients will continue to have heavy or bothersome bleeding after the procedure is done. But nine out of 10 are going to be satisfied and happy. So continued annoyed ble annoying bleeding is one of the kind of risks of that. Um, the other much less common risks would be um, infection, other irregular bleeding that may happen after the ablation, or uterine perforation. That's where we accidentally 
um, perforate or poke a hole through the uterine lining, through the muscle of the uterus, and then we may have to stop the procedure if that's the case. Most of these risks are very uncommon, and most, if they happen, are easily treated or have very low risk of severe complications. So high success rate, very low complication rate, makes this a great outpatient uh, surgical option for people with abnormal bleeding. So let's go take a look at how the Novashore endometrial ablation would work in an office setting. Okay, so after the patient checks in, we're gonna go into our procedure room directly with no delay. As we come into the room, you'll be welcomed by the nurse. She's gonna get you situated. You'll do a little bit of paperwork, answer any questions, make sure that you're doing fine as far as the medication that we gave you. And um, she'll kind of introduce you to all of the equipment and what to expect over the next few minutes, and then you'll get changed. So once the patient's in the room, we position them on the pelvic table. There are the stirrups that do come out to support the legs. Um, it's essentially like a pap smear. So we place a speculum, visualize the cervix, clean it off with some soap. And then the most important part of the whole procedure is numbing up that cervix so that you're very comfortable during the hysteroscopic portion of the case. That's the part where we look in this uterus with the camera and do our measurements. Um, numbing that cervix with lidocaine is critical and we do have to wait about five to 10 minutes after we do the numbing. So again, we'll just be chatting and talking about how your day goes, how's the weather, and anything that you might be interested in to help that time go quickly. Once that uh, numbing medicine has kicked in really well, we replace the speculum and then we start the procedure. We stretch open the cervix just enough to let the camera um, evaluate the uterine cavity. And then once we've done our measurements, we insert the Novasure device, which again is this thin little rod. This is the only part that goes in the uterus. And once that's in, we do open it up and the measurement or the instrument itself does the measurements for us. And again, that's a safety feature so that we know it's open in the right space and that it's gonna use the correct power to give you the best results possible. So that's hidden inside there. Once we insert that into the cervix, again, we open this up. So then we seal the cervix with this little plug. It just slides up to close the cervix off so none of the gas or fluid can escape during the procedure. Um, we do one more safety check to make sure everything is ready to go and then we activate the device and again it'll be activated for two minutes or less once we start that procedure that is where the cramping does start people will notice some labor type contractions or bad menstrual type cramping during those two minutes or less and then once the device has done its job it will just act it'll turn off automatically on its own we then carefully withdraw the device from inside the uterus and slide it out and look back in the uterus with the camera, showing that it did a very good job, a very thorough uh, ablation inside that endometrial cavity. Most people's pain sig gets significantly better as soon as the device is uh, turned off. So during the procedure, people will rate their pain six to eight out of 10. After the procedure's on, done, in just a matter of moments, uh, their pain drops to a zero to two. So again, a very quick recovery. Uh, from a very quick surgery. So one of the important parts about having the procedure in the office is keeping the patient comfortable so that we can complete the procedure. Um, the medicine that you take before you come to the office is very helpful for that. But the other part of this is that we're gonna have one to two nurses in the room. We're gonna try and keep you talking if that's what you prefer to help those two to five minutes pass very quickly uh, during the procedure. Uh, once the procedure is done, they do check your pain, and the vast majority of patients say after the procedure is completed, because the pain medicine is on board that you took that morning or that afternoon, um, their pain is anywhere from a zero to two. So they do recover very quickly after the procedure is done. Um, sometimes patients will get a little bit of juice, some crackers to make sure they're feeling great before they head home, and then you'll be able to go home. The typical time takes anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes of actual procedure or actual room time. Um, patients uh, recover very quickly once the procedure is done and they're walking out of here typically in about 40 minutes from the time they walk through the door, they're already on their way out to uh, drive home and kind of recover for that day. So if abnormal bleeding, heavy periods, prolonged periods is negatively affecting your quality of life, 
please come visit us at May Grant and we'll be able to help you through that. Find a solution that works for you and be able to um, help you get your life back.